and other considerations. Um, we'll look at how to use the HSE Stress Management Toolkit. Um, I'll talk about the detail behind that, the different steps to the management of the, the, the HSE the Toolkit. We'll touch on a little case study as well, um, something which is close to home. And it's quite a significant case study as well, so maybe you've heard of it already. But again, we will touch on that because I think, again, it underpins all the knowledge hopefully you'll get today. We'll look at the business benefits for managing work-related stress, understanding, the, obviously, the benefits of both the business, but also the individuals associated. And then we'll go over some simple takeaways you can do today, maybe in your business or, or your team of colleagues. Anj, next slide, please. Excellent. So what is work-related stress? We'll dive straight into it. So ultimately, as you can see there, the HSE defines stress as the adverse reaction people have to excessive pressures or other types of demand placed on them. So employees feel stress with they cope with pressures and other issues. Again, employers should match demands to employees' skills and knowledge set. So for example, employees can be stressed if they feel don't have the skills or time to meet or manage type deadlines. Providing planning, training, and support can reduce pressure and bring stress levels down potentially, but it's all about how we manage that process. Stress affects people differently. Absolutely agree with that. So what stresses me out might not stress you out and vice versa. However, factors like skills, experience, age, ability may all affect people or employees, whether they cope or not cope, should we say. And what, what's the purpose? Why should we tackle work-related stress? Well, work-related stress is a major cause of occupational health, which can cause severe physical and psychological conditions in your workers and your workforce. It can also lead to poor productivity potentially and human error, increased sickness absence, increases in accidents because we're not focused on what's in front of us, high staff turnover, poor performance in your organization generally. HSE statistics, um, as you will see soon, the figures are, are just going up and up and up. I guess because there's more knowledge associated with work-related stress and ill health. However, the, the total cost, they've put a rough figure on of approximately £5.2 billion pounds to industry, individuals and the government as a, as a cost figure. So obviously there's a, there's a reason, there's a purpose behind why we should carry this out. But also think from a health and safety perspective, you've got your legal, financial and moral duties. The legal side of it, obviously, under the Health and Safety at Work Act, we need to assess the level of risk from hazards in our workplace and to take all reasonably practicable measures to prevent or sufficiently reduce that risk. So the purpose of the risk assessment is to find out whether existing control measures we already have in place in our workplace are relevant or suitable and sufficient would be the key words. So hopefully as we go through this today, the, the discussion on the HSE's sort of management standards toolkit will be beneficial for you all. Ange, next slide, please. So work-related stress, depression or anxiety in Great Britain, as you can see here, the trend kind of plateaued, if you like, from 2001 all the way up to maybe 2014, 15, but, uh, as you can see here, it's starting to peak significantly. 17.9 million working days lost to work-related stress, depression, and or anxiety. Again, just astronomical figures. But when you think of it, I guess, hopefully, it's because we're talking about it more, that the awareness is there. So ultimately, it gives us the understanding of, of how we can deal with this situation moving forward. Ange, next slide, please. Breaking it down. Looking at the, the purposes of, or the rates per 100,000 workers, all stress per 100,000 workers accounts for 1,400. But when you actually look at the, the breakdown, look, look at that workload figure there. So a lot of people identify workload as one of their main stressors at work, which is quite significant. What that tells us is, from a risk assessment perspective, that's something we want to be focusing on. Role uncertainty, lack of control, and lack of support. That could be a communication and cooperation side of things. Things that work potentially, 
can affect us, um, whether we have been informed or uninformed of that process. And one that's quite significant, um, in my opinion, is our violence, threats or bullying element as well. Um, depends on what sort of work environment you're in. However, that would be a, a quite significant topic to consider. And then you've got all other options there as well. So straight away, what we can see looking at this slide is workload to us is a high risk. Next slide, please. Okay, so recognizing the signs, when it comes to work-related stress generally, we all have a part to play in this process, whether it's directors, senior management, all the way to operatives on the ground floor, the site, we all have a part to play in this. It's so important though, as it says on this slide, never make assumptions, but signs that a team member might be stressed could include the following. So changes in appetite, you know, um, it's, it's great when you work alongside a colleague, if you like, because you can see them on a daily basis, basis sorry. So if they tend to change their appearance because changes in appetite, they're not eating as they should be, the, the major weight loss, that can flag up a sign. The increase in poor coping mechanisms, such as smoking, increased alcohol consumption. Again, there's potential there where you might smell that, you know, that. They might not smoke, but now they've taken up smoking. It may be worth asking a question. An increase in sickness, absence, and or turning up late to work. Again, that is a telltale um, sign of work-related stress, you know, because, again, we mentioned that earlier, what stresses some people out may not stress others out. Everyone needs stress to be able to do something in life. However, too much stress can have the opposite effect. You don't want to do anything. You haven't got that motivation there. It's got their change in personal, usual behavior, mood, or how they interact with colleagues, you know, short and snappy. Um, you're going to get that feeling of, yeah, something's not right here. Is there opportunity to speak to this individual? Changing the standard of their work or focus on tasks. Um, I'm sure everybody's been stressed at some point in their work and career or even their home lives. And you're not really focused on what's in front of you because you're your mind's elsewhere, you know, you're focusing on what's stressing you out. Um, again, when it comes to quality of focus or even the health and safety of people on site, you know, we want them to be focused in that time, what they're actually carrying out. Appear entire anxious or withdrawn, reduce interest in the task they've previously enjoyed, potentially. Um, even basic stuff like if they want to talk about the football and not bothered by it. it, it could be as basic as that. And there's a, a very particular on higher than normal staff turnover if you're if you've got a high rate of of people's stress because of their work life balance or their pressures generally in their workload staff turnover is going to be quite significant so it could be not will be but it could be a potential so recognizing these signs of stress early on will help employers to manage potential stressors within the workplace while working in partnership with any affected employees to support them in their daily role Again, looking at this, why is this important? Well, ultimately, from the HSE management standards approach, this has given us telltale signs when it comes to our risks associated with stress. Okay, so it helps us develop this holistic picture. Next slide, please, Andrew. So HSE management standards, you know, the, the management standards approach got very, I think there's, there's five, six different standard approaches, but we'll, we'll get onto them in the next slide. Ultimately, it states that the represent conditions that if present demonstrate good practice through a step-by-step -step risk assessment approach, as with anything to do with health and safety generally, there's that risk assessment approach, which is a step-by-step -step process, which I'll talk you through. Allow assessment of the current situation using pre-existing data, surveys, and other techniques. So pre-existing data could include ill health data from your company. It could include staff turnover, all these existing elements of your, your data collection you may have. Um, promote active discussion and work in partnership with employees and their representatives to help decide on practical improvements that can be made. Again, that, there's a key word that I guess, practical improvements that could be made. You know, We can't just sit back and not do any work and get paid. It doesn't work that way. But it's all about having that balance, I would say. 
Help simplify risk assessment for work-related stress by identifying the main risk factors. Again, with anything, it's the significant thing, things that can affect us at work. Help the employers focus on the underlying causes of their prevention. Now, the underlying causes may not be the most obvious um, cause of stress, but it's hopefully by following the step-by-step -step approach that'll be clear to identify. And provide a yardstick which organisations can gauge their performance in tackling key causes of stress. So this is the whole purpose of the HSE management standards. Developing a base level standard within your company to allow you to assess holistically, do an initial assessment, and then hopefully year on year or every two years, whatever your approach is, we can review and hopefully get that continuous improvement. Next slide, please, Andrew. So this brings us on to the HSE management standards approach. So as we, we said earlier, it covers six key areas of work design that if properly managed or associated with poor health, lower productivity, increased accident and sickness absence rates. These standards are the following. So we've got demands, control, support, relationships, role and change. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of run through them briefly, um, give you an underlying what the standard should be and, and what should be happening to meet this standard. So demands, as you can see there, this includes issues such as a workload, your work patterns, and generally the work environment. This standard is that employees indicate that they're able to cope with the demands of their jobs and systems are in place locally to respond to any individual concerns. So this is people, employees, openly discussing demands at work. So what should be happening to meet this standard? The organization provides employees with adequate achievable demands in relation to the agreed hours of work. So setting out a baseline, this is what's achievable in your work position. People's skills and abilities are matched to their job demands. So if a company is expecting an employee to carry out an activity, the employee's abilities should match the demands of that business, whether it be skills, knowledge, training. Jobs are designed within the capabilities of employees and employees' concerns about their work environment are addressed. So as an example, someone has got a concern, it could be something like lighting levels, it could be noise, whatever it is, as long as it's addressed by management and there's some plan put in place and the management of that process, hopefully the demands are met. So that's demands generally. We'll then move on to control. So the control, as it states on here, is how much say the person has in the way they carry out their work activities. So the standard is that employees indicate that they're able to have a say about the way they do the work. So they may have a time management issue. Um, they may have, I don't know, a requirement whereby they want to pick and choose their activities potentially. And systems are in place low to respond to individual concerns. So again, it's that policy and procedure, that process of identifying this individual's concerns, how they have a say about how they do their work and how that's implemented. So what should be happening to meet this standard? Where possible, employees have a control over the pace of work, how fast they carry out their activities. Employees are encouraged to use their initiative. Um, to carry out their work activities. So giving them an onus to carry out their own demands of the job. The organization encourages employees to develop their skills. So it may be part of their ongoing training program. It may be out of hours training, whatever. Employees are consulted over their work patterns generally and also when they have a say, when they can carry out a break with their work as well. So that's the control process. So how much say an employee or an uh, operative an individual has over their work. Support includes encouragement, sponsorship, um, resources provided by the organization, line management and colleagues. Ultimately, this standard is employees indicate that receive adequate information and support from colleagues and superiors generally. So how should this be happening? Basically, the organization has policies and procedures to adequately support employees at all stages of the business. Systems are in place to enable and encourage managers to support their staff and colleagues. So again, making sure there's relevant resources, time there, 
employees know how to access required resources to carry out their job as well. And also a two-way dialogue there between employees and their management for, for regular and constructive feedback. So that's the support element, make, making sure that somebody feels like they have that support and entitlement between management and their own colleagues. Next one, relationship. This includes promoting positive work and to avoid conflict and dealing with un unacceptable behavior. So I mentioned earlier on then statistics about violence and aggression. So this is where this relationship element falls into place. So the standards that employees indicate they are not subjected to unacceptable behaviors, i.e. bullying at work. Organization promotes positive behaviors to work and avoid conflict and ensure fairness, inclusion and respect of each other. The organizations agree policies and procedures to prevent or resolve unacceptable behavior. Now that's a key element there. So if somebody does do something wrong, which is unacceptable to the business, how do we deal with that process? There's gotta be a policy and procedure in place. Systems are in place to enable, encourage managers and employees to deal with unacceptable behavior and also to report unacceptable behaviors as well. So that whole process of, of letting individuals know within the business that they can come forward with concerns. You know, they don't keep it to themselves, that relationship element. The role, this includes whether people understand their role within the organization and whether the organization ensures the person does not have conflicting roles. So ultimately, this standard is all about ensuring that the individual understands their role and responsibility. So how this should be happening is ensuring the organization provides information to employees to understand their roles and responsibilities, whether it be a formal role and responsibility document for, taken directly from the management system, or whether it's just communication along that process. Regular team meetings, regular PDRs, um, personal appraisals, that sort of thing. And then finally, change. Now, change is an interesting one because a lot of times this is where it falls down. So organizational change, people not being fully aware of changes in their business generally. This is this element. So it includes how organizational change, large or small, is managed and communicate within the organization. Now, what companies fail to do in this instance, in my opinion, is it'll be communicated at senior level, management level, but what about the cool face, the, the people in the pointy end? Are they informed of all these changes? Because ultimately, if, they, if the people on the workforce, if you like, the ground floor on the tools can see changes, but they're not being communicated about that, that could unsettle people. So this standard, how, how we should approach this standard is engaging with people when undergoing organizational change at all levels. Employees are aware of the probable impact of any changes to their job role. And if necessary, employees are given training to support any change in their job scope. So if we're going down a different element of work or there's a, a management buyout and merging with a different company, it's all about this discussional pace. You're not telling people it's discussion, it's a two-way dialogue. Employees have access to relevant support during these changes as well, that's quite significant. So who are they supposed to talk to if they've got an issue? Um, that needs to be notified from the get-go. So ultimately, this is your six key areas of, of design, your HSE management standards. And this is something that we're going to approach as we move forward. Next slide, please, Ange. So the HSE management standards, how are we going to implement this approach? Well, basically, the first thing is we need to actually prepare the organization for these management standards, what we're going to adopt. So what we need to do is secure commitment from senior managers, whether it's approval, because we need support, we need the resources for tackling issues. And in particular, SAF time more than anything, because that's where it's all coming from, that's where it's being driven. We need to secure commitment from employees and their representatives as well, potentially. We need to look at this steering group approach. The steering group will, will dive into a little bit um, as to the understanding of that steering group and why they're important. We need to consider the actual planning of the project as well. Again, we're going to dive into each of these elements, but just giving you a brief overview, the final potential there is this communication of our policies and potentially organisational stress policy. So this first section here, 
secure your commitment, the legal case, the business case, and the moral case. As I mentioned, health and safety is all like three key things. So straight away, the legal case, we know the management regs 1999 state we must do risk assessment. We must assess the risk of stress-related ill health arising from work activities. And the Health and Safety Work Act requires an employer to make measures to control that risk. So that's your legal base. Again, so when you're preparing your organization, senior management, director level, wherever it may be, this is where you're pitching. This is the legal requirement. Then you may consider the business case. So maintaining business output and performance generally. You know, if, if we've got a good morale within the business, that it's always going to benefit the output and performance of any, any business. Staff performance and productivity generally, the morale levels, a reduced staff turnover and tendency to leave. So you're retaining all these employees which you've trained up, you've given all this knowledge and experience to. They want to stay there because they feel valued. Staff recruitment, it may become easier when people want to work for your business. And then the, the long run of things is potentially customer satisfaction. Organizational image and reputation. So more work might just come your way generally without even trying. And also reduces potential litigation measures as well. And then think about the moral case. So prolonged periods of stress generally, including work-related stress, have an adverse effect on health and the strong links between stress and physical conditions such as heart disease, back pain, headaches, psychological effects and, and such as anxiety and depression. Stress can also lead to other behaviours which are harmful to health as well, such as drinking too much, too much caffeine intake, potentially alcohol, drug abuse or smoking. So ultimately, from a moral perspective, we just want to make sure everybody is in good health in our place of work. And that can happen through various means, hopefully, as we're going to go through here. Steering groups. So steering groups, smaller organizations may not have a formal steering group as such, but for larger organizations, they may benefit from having a representative group. So think about who would be part of a steering group and what's the purpose. So in my head, a typical steering group would consider senior managers you know somebody who's got the potential to change from a high level but also think about employees and their representatives potentially a health and safety manager or person in your place of work hr any line managers what i'm trying to get at is consider people at every level of your organization not just high level the key activities of the steering group well, the key activities generally would be considering the actual policy and procedure. You know, think about what they're actually going to call the project. What sort of resources do they need? Any communications? Ultimately, the, the overarching element is the agreed action plan. So we, this is our business, how it looks now. This is what we're going to put into place. What do we want to look at in five, maybe 10 years time? The planning of the project, though, is often more than not the, the key element of this whole stage. Don't overlook the planning element. It has to be thought out in a thorough process. You should check what you've already got in place. That might consider things such as your stress management policy already. So has that got any holes and any gaps consideration from the steering group? Don't reinvent the wheel if you've already got something like that in place. Maybe it just wants streamlined. There will be existing policies and procedures in your place of work, which may link to stress management. Other tips I've considered from other people who have carried out this is small, start small. Other companies which have carried out this activity have started small and then grew this. Don't create a huge beast. Just start small, things you can change, and then grow this approach. Planning experience. So make sure the planning element's carried out in a thorough manner before you roll this out. Don't roll it out in a rush and then start scratching and think, oh, I wish I'd done that better. I wish I'd done this better. Make sure the planning element is well thought out before you run this process. Make sure you've got that, the adequate resources, I would say. 
relevant and adequate resources to carry out these management standards and roll it out to your business in a thorough manner. And I would kind of summarize that planning of the project by being realistic, you know, have smart objectives, something which you can achieve. Don't shoot for the stars immediately. Make sure it is realistic and achievable. And then finally, in this section here, you've got communications and policies. So what we're talking about when it comes to communications and policy is the management standard approach does require the partition, participation and input of different groups of employees. Every level must have a vital part in engaging the process and being involved with this process. Like I mentioned earlier, although senior management will have a lot of pull in terms of resources, the people on the coal face may have more interface when it comes to the actual real causes of stresses at work. So there's potential there um, of, of getting some really good feedback. Next slide, please, Ange. So HSE management standards approach. If you go from one to five on the whole management standards criteria, it will read as if you're doing a risk assessment. And that's exactly what it is. So you're identifying the risk factors. Understand how the management standards that we've just been over translate to your organization. They might not overlap. There might be individual elements. They might combine but it needs to be considered. Understand who can be harmed and how. The reason why we consider that is obviously it's, it's a fundamental part of risk assessment. So it's a good idea of getting information, for example, um, disciplinary issues that might in include poor management approach, uh, disfaction from the work process, or how's the work organized. But ultimately, this is the approach and it, and we often say your, your risk assessment's only good as, as the, the risk factors you identify, but also who can be harmed and how they can be harmed. A good source of information for this element would be existing information which you carry out on checks. It may be, I don't know, part of your KBI, KPI process, such as sickness, absenteeism data, productivity data, staff turnover, disciplinary data, accidents, the list goes on. One which I find would be a really good element to review would be feedback from staff, um, whether this is a face-to-face -face sort of dialogue or it's a um, yeah, misreporting process or even just a two-way dialogue discussion on the, on the shop floor. It's well worth considering. And also, as we've been over there, the HSE management standards tool is a critical element. So evaluating the risks. Explore problems and basically develop your solutions. So the main aim of this step is to basically take all that data collection that you've done in, in sections one and two, if you like, from the previous steps and talk conclusions through with your representatives of the steering group. So yes, we've got all this data, all this information, we've been at all these different levels of our organization. Now what? So again, going to your steering groups or your focus groups, it helps identify and discuss these matters. So to try and iron them out, highlight the main elements which keep getting flagged, not so much the insignificant ones, and then we can deal with them as an immediate cause. Use your focus group to link problems and solutions. Um, potentially it's already been a, a case before and it's, it's linked in one way or another. Your, your discussion group as well considers people at all levels of the organization. So they may have a conclusion immediately as well. So there's potential there. Record your findings, develop and implement action plan. We mentioned the action plan earlier. The good thing about an action plan is it gives you a clear and concise path of where your business is heading, hopefully. It helps you set goals and prioritize these goals into significant and not so significant ones, but ultimately you're considering them at every level. Your action plan ultimately should be a working document as well. I would like to state that. So as you're going through this process, it's all about updating and reviewing, maybe biannually, maybe every quarter. It depends on what your process is from your peer review groups. And finally, you've got this monitor and review process. So the monitoring process is all about reviewing your action plan and ensure agreed actions are being implemented effectively. 
evaluate, check the solutions you've implemented are even effective. So you might set a time scale of like, in five years, I want our business to look like this, but if it's not working by year one, we need to put something else in place. We need to review this process. And potentially decide on what further information or data gathering you may need. So you might drop your annual appraisals down every six months for certain individuals. It all needs to be considered. Remember, this isn't the end of the approach. Once you've con completed this one to five process, it's all about continuous improvement. So you need to be on this. It may even form part of your management review on an annual basis, but you need to be, this needs to form part of your business generally, your work and business, your day-to-day -day use. It can't just be made up and forgot about. It has to form part of the fundamental operation of your business. So even if you think you've significantly improved your stress management in work and reduced the impact of work-related stress, you still need to review it and reassess the risk to ensure it doesn't reoccur. So it's put to bed, it's dealt with. Next slide, Ange. So what to do next? Ultimately review organization policies, procedures. There's potential there that your policies and procedures within your business may skirt around in a, in a roundabout way, stress management, such as bullying, harassment, uh, sickness absence, equality, diversity. Um, all these policies and procedures will form part of your overall overarching stress management policy, but have you got a fundamental one which states stress management? It may be worth considering. Making the management standards part of everyday activity. So as we mentioned earlier, the concern of preventing and managing common health problems and improve performance in your organization generally. So it's that five-step approach, which we've just been through there on the, on the continuous improvement wheel, if you like. It needs to form part of your everyday activity. Develop your managers. You know, no one's going to be perfect at this straight away, but we need to have managers in the relevant areas which can identify and manage potential sources of work-related stress. Yes, we talk about it, but are people fully aware of what they should be looking for, signs, symptoms? If not, we can develop our managers to identify and spot signs of stress and work-related stress at that. Develop your employees as well. So ensure that they are aware that if they recognize that they are being stressed due to work-related issues, they can bring it forward and are able to seek advice from relevant parties. This again is where you develop your employees for identifying it and your managers for dealing with it. And finally, review. Review your risk assessment regularly once you've got your management standards risk assessment in place after any significant change and check whether you need to put in place new or more interventions to generate better stress management within your business. Next slide, please, Ange. So the, the case which I mentioned, um, now it's on the screen here. People may or may not recognise this case. So this is Water versus Northumberland County Council, which occurred in 1995. And it's all about employers' duty to provide safe system of work and whether the duty extended to the risk of psychiatric illness. Now, just a little bit about the facts of this case. So Mr. Walker was a social worker employed by the defendant, Northumberland County Council, who had a heavy, emotionally demanding caseload and suffered a mental breakdown in 1986. Upon his return to work, he repeatedly requested assistance, but the defendant provided no additional support and he suffered a second breakdown in 1987. He was dismissed due to ill health and brought an action against the defendant for breaching their duty of care to take steps to ensure he had a manageable workload. So the issues associated with this case, the defendant's employer, under the duty of care to provide a safe system of work to its employees, Mr. Walker argued the duty of care extended to taking reasonable steps to avoid risk of exposing him to a workload, which is detrimental to his health. The defendants argued on policy grounds that due to the general lack of resources within the county council, it was inappropriate for the court to evaluate the reasonableness of their operational allocation of resources to that case. The case was held as there was no logical reason to exclude the risk of psychiatric injury from an employer's duty of care. 
as the first breakdown was not reasonably foreseeable, the defendants were not in breach for failing to take steps to avoid it. However, the second breakdown was foreseeable. If Mr. Walker was not offered additional support, regard, regard sorry, should be had the resources available for, to the defendant, but it was right and proper for the court to evaluate their conduct. And given the gravity of the illness and the level of risk, the defendants won't breach of duty for failing to take reasonable steps to avoid it. So in a nutshell, the first instance of the breakdown was not foreseeable. However, Mr. Walker raised the flag on numerous occasions. Um, and then a second breakdown occurred, which was foreseeable, therefore the case stood. So as we can see here, it's all about if somebody raising this um, the flag of, of, of having a, a, a huge workload, you know, it's, it's unbearable, people can't deal with it, given the, the demands of the job. We can't dismiss it, we need to take it and approach it in a thorough manner, risk assess it appropriately. Um, again, as you can see here, it's clear to see that we do prosecute in these cases as well. Next slide, please, Ange. So benefits of preventing stress in the workplace. The, obviously various benefits, economic benefits, as you can see there, lower risk of litigation because we're complying with legal duties, improve, improve return on investment and training development. You know, we're gonna go through this process of hopefully getting individuals who want to stay at our business and we're gonna process them through, get them all this training, knowledge, experience, and we we'll want to ensure that we retain that. Improve customer care relationships with clients and suppliers and potentially reduce costs of sick pay Sickness cover, overtime and recruitment, obviously, which are all just overhead costs. Benefits for individuals, however, people do feel more motivated and committed to their work when they feel valued. You know, there's a lot to be said for that. The value of the person at their business, they will put in everything they've got. Morale is high at the business. People feel they're part of a team and the decision-making process and fairness and can accept change slightly better when people are consultated and communicated with, you know, it, it paints a better picture for everybody. Relationship with managers and teams are much better. You know, they're getting that two-way dialogue. They're not being told what they're doing. They're being asked the question, can you do this? What, what's your concerns? You get a lot more employee engagement in that process as well. People are happy in the work and they don't want to leave, especially if they've got a say in their matter, how they, the time constraints, how they go about their business, when they can take their own breaks. It, it forms a good picture. Line managers can outwardly, outwardly show their duty of care to individuals as well. And line managers can demonstrate good management skills that could help their promotability, I guess, and career development. And finally, from a management benefit, it's, it's talking about yeah, all the reduced performance in their in staff turnover, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll retain that staff. You, you won't have the intention to leave once they've hit our level within your business. They'll want to stick around. Better absence management, uh, fewer accidents because people are more focused in their line of work, um, especially if the stress is less, you know, you can focus on what's in front of you. Hopefully improved work quality, improve organizational image and reputation generally, and better staff understand and tolerance of others experiencing problems as well. So they've got that morale and they've got the understanding on every level that if somebody's got a problem, we can hopefully engage with that person and rectify it. Next slide, please, Ange. So key messages to take away from today. So did you know? People are experiencing long-term stress, may notice an impact on their sleep, memory, a change in eating habits, a decline in their motivation, exercise generally. Um, in 2019, 20, stress, depression, anxiety accounted for 51% of all work-related ill health cases and 55% of all working days lost due to work-related ill health. Absolutely staggering figures, especially when we relate that to a cost um, of 5.2 billion pounds significant. Of the adults participate in a recent survey, this is from the Mental Health Foundation, who said they felt stressed at some point in their lives. 16% they had said, sorry, they had self-harmed, and 32% said they had suicidal thoughts and feelings, which is quite staggering, um, especially when you look at the figures in the Northeast generally. 
um, it, it's, it's very significant when it comes to the, the mental health side of things as well, which I'm conscious I don't want to touch on today. And the main work factors cited by respondents is causing work-related stress, depression, and anxiety were workload pressures, including tight deadlines and too much responsibility. That shouts out construction to me. And a lack of managerial support. So straight away, what I'm giving you there is two key risk areas to take away with you. So when you're considering your health and safety, your HSE management standards approach to, to stress management, there's two free of charge for you. So work pressures, including tight deadlines and too much responsibility and a lack of managerial support. Next, next slide, please, Ange. So yes, as Ange mentioned earlier, um, if you've got any questions, please fire away. If not, please email mail us and we'll do our best to come back with you with any answers which we may have. Um, but thank you very much for bearing with us and listening to, to the, the presentation. Ange? Thank you very much, Martin. Great job, as always. Has anybody got any questions? Because there's nothing has appeared in the chat uh, at all yet. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody's got any questions or not. Does anybody want to come off mute to ask any questions? Um, Can we have a copy of the slides, please? Um, yes, I think yes, Michael Thompson's also asked that as well. Yeah, that's not a problem yet. Definitely you can, yes. Yeah, no problem. Sorry, was that somebody there saying that they had a question? Sorry, uh, I've just heard something and then... Somebody... No, I think it was me. <laughs> oh, was it you? Oh, right, okay. Uh, the chat, two seconds. It just says, can we have a copy of slides? Yes, no problem. Um, yeah, and somebody was telling me how to do the mute. <laughs> All good. Um, so no, there's no other questions at the moment. Oh, is it a legal requirement to have a, to have a stress in the workplace policy? Going back to the management regulations and health and safety work, that'd be very, very difficult to argue not to have one. Does anybody, just if anybody wants to drop into the chat box, does anybody have any um, other um, subject areas or titles or something that they want to be copied, uh, to be covered in another webinar? Because like I say, we've done uh, vibration, we've done the grants and the funding, we've done the fire safety bill, which we will redo again once it becomes a fire safety act later on in the year. Uh, and now we've just done the stress uh, webinar. Does anybody, like I say, does anybody have any other topics if you do if you want to just drop them in the chat box or etc that would be uh, great just looking at the questions oh hang on there's a new message here yeah it's a good mental one health Steve. Health. yeah it's a very good point that mental health first aid is for companies beneficial absolutely and it's exactly that a first aid isn't it first port of call the, only, the only thing i'd add to that is um Sometimes people, I've found people do have people trained as mental health first aiders and then they think they've ticked the box and they've done the job. And actually, okay. that's just the start. Um, it's a great start and it, it's really good, but that's just the start. Um, you need to have then a policy, a procedure and how you're going to actually execute it. Um, somebody's asked about pregnancy risk assessments. Are you asking, should you have them? Um, because definitely, yes. Anybody with a child there in age? Uh, trying to think. Anything else coming up? Uh, thank you for the webinar, very informative. Thank you, Samantha. If there's nothing from anybody else, because it is, I hope you will send the slides to the mail. We will be sending the slides to the addresses on the um, Eventbrite where you registered. That's where the, they will be sent to along with a feedback form um, and a link to the recording if you need it. Yeah, so we've got, we've got a, couple of, um, a couple of good topics there which are coming up as well. Support and pregnant, pregnant women. Yeah, support and pregnant women and noise. Yeah, noise is the workplace, always interesting. Yeah, 
zero tolerance at work do you mean with regards to stress bullying that sort of thing just out of curiosity staff and public okay so zero tolerance yeah okay yeah I, i'll kind of get where you're coming from with that now yeah that's fine prosperity protection as well good yeah could link up respiratory diseases generally yeah there's just some topics coming through so i'll capture all of that yeah um anything else anybody I'm trying to see if anything else is dropping into the chat box at the moment if anybody else has got any other questions or topics you think of later on um you've got the email address um which i'll put out in now um and then if you want to just email us we will speak to debbie who we liaise with at the hsc who's the secretary of the working well together northeast branch and we will come up with um, some more topics uh, and we'll answer any questions that you've got. Yeah. So ask them about workplace related stress incidents. Right, okay. Safety tours of site uh, work. Yeah, we, we will do, um, that's the sort of thing we have got, I think it's excavations type, um, session coming up later on in the year and we will start to get back to doing things like that it's just for us it's it's at the point where we can do it with regards to the covid restrictions so we are looking at that sort of thing at the moment a new message is there a working well together set up for london and southeast yeah there definitely uh, there is, there is um i can find you the details of that um so I'll just take your notes down and I will make sure that, that comes out to you. There's working well together groups across the whole of the country. There's there's a number of them. So definitely there will be. Any workplace stress related incidents. Uh, can you share any workplace stress related incidents um, with us? Somebody's asking Martin. Can you share any workplace stress-related incidents that you can share with us now? How are you testing us? As a root cause? I think, do you, I think they mean as examples. Well, in, in fairness, I've got, I've got a fair few, but they're all to do with that health and safety incidents that we're currently dealing with. Can you make discussion about WFH and WFO? What the pros and cons and how they are related to stress at work? I'm not sure I know what that means. Working from home and working oh. from the office. <laughs> Thank you. That's <laughs> it. That, yeah, it's a very valid point though, in fairness, because uh, they are going to come with their own challenges now, aren't they? Each has their own stresses added into them, um, and that has to be done on a person by person basis. I can give you a prime example. So if you like, when we started with COVID last year and most of our staff were put out onto furlough for April, when making a decision on who to bring back, we decided it not on skill sets, but on personal circumstances. And the first sort of person we brought back was somebody who was working from home, um, living on their own. And it was because that was more stressful for them. So that's how we considered how and who and when to bring people back. So um, it's you've got to look on it on a person by person basis, because what stresses one person working from home wouldn't stress somebody else. I guess it's it's volumed as well by the fact that um, we've obviously got this current pandemic going on and people have got their own opinions on this. How to deal with a bully and a vindictive bosses? Uh, it's kind of not. I think I know. Have, they got, have you not got access to HR? Yeah, I've been there. I've had it, so I, I do appreciate it. Is an absolute nightmare. 
Um, but uh, but unless they're taken to task, and I think yeah, it's HR. That's what, yeah, it's very difficult for us to comment on that. Yeah, if they've got nobody hiring them as well, it gets a bit difficult. So yeah, yeah HR. Yeah, but uh, can it comes down to staff turnover when people leave, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, right, we are now at almost one o'clock. Um, we are still getting things coming in. Um, just looking at the questions coming in. Right, one more. Thanks for the webinar. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, I think we're losing uh, uh, half the people have gone now. So I think I can't yeah. see anything else that's come in now. So if anybody else wants to email us, if you've got any questions, um, otherwise uh, we will look at the further topics that people have suggested and look at what's going to be put on in the future. Hope everybody has a great summer because let's face it, we're right in the middle of the summer and we will be back as working well together hopefully in person from the autumn. Um, thank you very much everybody for coming along today. And thank you, Martin, for yeah. your time and effort because I know how much effort you put in today. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.